Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. Rabbi Dr. Daniil Hartman is president of the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem and holds the Kaufman Family Chair in Jewish Philosophy. He is the founder of some of the most extensive education, training, and enrichment programs for scholars, educators, rabbis, and religious and lay leaders in Israel and North America. A prominent essayist, blogger, and lecturer on issues of Israeli politics, policy, Judaism, and Jewish community, he is the host of the award-winning podcast, For Heaven's Sake. He is literally my rabbi every week. I never miss an episode of that podcast, and he co-hosts it with Yossi Klein Halevi. Hartman is the author of the highly regarded book, Putting God Second, How to Save Religion from Itself. And his most recent book, which we're going to talk about today, is called Who Are the Jews and Who Can We Become? It was published in November 2023. Welcome to the broadcast, Rabbi Hartman. I hope I can call you Danielle today. We can. Hi, Abby. <laughs> um, before we get to the book, I just want to kind of get to your Israeli soul right now. We're talking on day uh, 177 of the hostages being taken and the war having begun. Um, I saw uh, many interviews preparing for this that you have done in these last weeks, but one in particular, in particular you talked about being an optimist but always a realist. So I just want to start with the realism. It Where, challenges my optimism. <laughs> we'll get to the optimism later. Let's start with the realism. Kind of what are you sitting with? We're in a very confused place right now. We don't have the right leadership. And as a result, it's very hard for a people to develop a strategy. That's the job of leaders. People are supposed to respond. We have opinions about tactics. But it's very clear that Israel is more or less rudderless. Um, and you sense it in the people. Um, uh, what, are, what are we supposed to do? So are we going to move into Rafa or are we not going to move into Rafa? So everybody says we're moving into Rafa. OK. But are we doing anything to prepare to move into Rafa? No. What does Gaza the day after look like? Everybody knows for months that we need to do this. What are, are we preparing for it? No. We now are dealing with a much more volatile north, which many in the Jewish community are, are aware of, but in the world, it's a hidden war. There's 100,000 Israelis who can't go back home. They're just not safe. And so we could declare, yes, we're going to make it safer than they've ever been. But it's just how? I understand. Like, give me a strategy. How do you plan on dealing with Hezbollah? How do you plan on dealing with Iran? Do you have a strategy or do you just have an ideology that we have a right to? So there is this ongoing, there's a word in Hebrew, it's called lidashtish, which it's, there's a word for words that sound like what they are. I, I don't know, it's some fancy word. I, I, oh, wow, you actually know that word. Amazing. It's, it's about- like babbling <laughs> brook. Yeah, it's like lidashtish. It's like you're just sort of, you're stuck. Mm. You're stuck in the mud. You're not going anywhere. But when you say rudder, that the people are rudderless, you've also talked about how cohesive the, the people, people are have cohesive. Been. That's a tactic. How organized they became in the absence of leadership. Right, but that's for, for that which we could handle. Mm. Um, and what we could handle is actually far more than what we expected because the government is supposed to take care of internal policy, and it turns out that it didn't, but that we marshaled in Israel and Jews around the world. We actually got into the military vest business. Like, <laughs> look, this is like as strange as it might sound. We got into the military. Well, we know people about- People were sending ceramic, ceramic vests. Ceramic, we bypassed the army's procurement system, and we were providing soldiers with everything under the sun. We provided networks for people to actually reach the front lines. We provided food and support for families. On a domestic level, we also, it wasn't a strategy. When, when the community um, uh, marshals its forces, it's a tactic. Now, a strategy, when especially when it comes to foreign policy, we could vote, we could protest. But it's not, nobody's calling Daniil and saying, Daniil, could you please set for us our policy in Rafa? Maybe in my fantasies they would, but it's probably outside of my, out of my uh, expertise. But what do you plan on doing? How do you think about Israel's relationship to the world? How do you talk about it? We are now 
more dependent on the world than we've been probably in the last 40, 50 years, since 73. But that means if that's a reality, and if our security is based on that, then what do you do? How do you build a relationship with the world? What is the world looking from you, and how do you respond to it? It's not a foreign minister who gets up and anytime someone says something he doesn't like, basically says, well, you're an anti-Semite, a plague on all your houses. That's more or less the, the, the level of spokesmanship coming out of the foreign ministry. These aren't strategies. We have, we have major issues. So right now, the, we've evolved beyond October 7th. The security danger, the army responded. The trauma, the tragedy is still there. The hostages are still there. But we're beginning to look at what is Israel tomorrow going to look like, and there's nobody really talking about it. When you talk about the world, I just want to touch on world opinion, because so much of, in a way, the Israeli ethos has been, we have to operate despite the world. And I think on your podcast, you're somewhat talking about how the world also matters. So can you kind of help us Right, the Israeli ethos that we could act despite the world was always a lie. Because, like, let's take the great example of Israeli chutzpah, Entebbe. How did we get to Entebbe? On an American Hercules. What guns were we shooting? Where were our weapons, where were our um, uniforms made? The notion that we are independent and could function in, you know, regardless of what world opinion is, is, um, is it's just, it's, it's a lie. It's simply a lie. Um, we could run out of bombs. Literally, we could run out of bombs. The planes which we purchased from America could run out of bombs. If we have to go to war with the Hezbollah, do you know what type of, of arms um, um, shipments we're going to require? It's going to make this ceramic vest lifeline of the Jewish world. It looked like, like, a, picture. like a little child's play. Do you know what we're going to need to do that? Now, how do you go about doing that without world approval, without America's support? Now, you don't need the whole world. There are certain key figures, and the principal one is America, but it's not just. England, France, Germany have all been staunch supporters of Israel for decades, decades. Forget the 60s, decades. We count on them. They don't veto in the uh, Security Council, but they're there. They support us. Our Germany is selling us major, major, our submarines mm -hmm. all come from Germany. These are, like, we're not an island. We're dependent on the world militarily, politically. If we don't have an American veto in the Security Council, what does that mean? What does it mean for us? We could become overnight, it could be illegal, sanctions could be put against us. These aren't, you know, these aren't far-fetched ideas. Now, it, it undermines some of the Zionist ethos, because the Zionist ethos was basically built on the idea that the world hates us. And it was. The Balfour um, Declaration of, of 1917 basically should have said to the Jews of, America, of, of, of England who came and said, you know, we want a state of our own. Post-emancipation, the world should have said, what do you need a state of your own for? You're at home here. We just, we're creating all these nation states that aren't contingent on religious affiliation. They're dependent on whether you were born here and on, your, on, on some new form national identity. The Jews who said we're a nation, they should have said, what are you talking about? What do I need you? You don't need your own nation. England, France, Germany are your home. We embrace you. Just like Napoleon declared in, in uh, what was it, in beginning of the, 20, of the 19th century. But they didn't because they never really saw us as part of them. So when Jews said we're a separate nation, they said, ah, yes, you are. So actually the formation of Zionism was contingent and dependent on some level of anti-Semitism. Let's call it benevolent anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism which hates the Jews enough not to want us to be a part of them, but doesn't hate us enough to want to kill us, and actually sees it in their self-interest to be rid of us. So, that so we'll put you over there. We'll put you over there. So the Zionist ethos was, we are alone. Mm. We're alone. And initially, we, de we were dependent on, on Jewish um, um, support. But as the country grew and, 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 and became stronger and stronger, and the world became more complicated, and, the, and our enemies became stronger, it wasn't for France in 67, it wasn't from, for America from the beginning in, in, in 73. If they said no more weapons, what would we have done? So Zionism doesn't want to admit it, 
but we're not the this macho super, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a great fantasy, you know, to, to be the antidote of the diasporic weakling. And now we have Jews of muscle, great. But muscles don't actually count that much anymore. You need guns, you need bullets, you need tanks, you need sophisticated weapons. Well, I want to talk about those, how those weapons were used, the IDF for a minute, and the ethos of an army that you have served. Um, you've talked so much about how you seem to have a real kind of certainty um, about how the IDF conducts itself, knowing the training because you experienced the training and you yourself were uh, in a position of authority. The world doesn't see it that way, much of the world. I don't want to overgeneralize. They do see and suspect that there is some kind of ethnic cleansing uh, going on that's, that isn't admitted to. Can you just address for the American viewer, sure. who hopefully is going to hear it from you, just how, how do you manage those accusations and that, those assumptions? See, first of all, anybody who assumes that an army doesn't make a mistake is just, again, not living in the real world. The battlefield is filled with mistakes, always. 20, 25 percent of casualties are self-inflicted. We shoot each other. Forget even civilians. 20 to 25 percent of all military casualties are self-inflicted. So in the battle, the, the fog is so immense. I, I remember we had never, um, this goes back to 1982, we, I was on an, a, I was a commander of an M48 um, tank, which was a phenomenal tank in the Korean War. It was really cutting edge for the Korean War. I was still fighting on it in 1982. And Israel had just introduced Merkavaz. And there was one unit of Merkavaz. And all of a sudden, on Say what that is. Merkavaz, the Israeli, is the new Israeli battle tank. Back then it was new and it's developed over, it's now Merkava 4B something. There's many uh, um, okay. um, um, models. But all of a sudden, the battalion commander gets on the, um, on the, on the radio and I'm pushing here because that's where your radio is when you're like to speak. And on the radio, and he says, um, to, the, to, the, um, to the north, 2,000, enemy forces, fire. So once this is, and this is broadcast to everybody. And then so it comes, you know, I hear it. I go down, then you go into uh, fire mode. You start, you look, you find a target, you measure the distance, you pick the shell, you tell your, you tell your tank, um, in, you know, in the north, 2,000 um, enemy tanks, um, and then you say, put in, an, and you pick one of the shells, and you measure, and then you give the fire, you say, fire. And between your saying fire, and when your gunner fires, is about a second and a half. I gave the order to fire on enemy, because from 2,000 um, meters away, we didn't know what a Merkavala, we thought it was a T-72. And then literally a tenth of a second, before my, my loader, just gunner, went like this. Cease fire, cease fire. This happens all the time. We're firing on each other. We don't know. Now we're getting better at it, but still in Gaza, they're speaking about 20%. So the fact that sometimes we're going to use the wrong bombs. There was a case in, um, in, in the refugee camp in central Gaza where the army admitted that it made a mistake. It was supposed to use a precision bomb, and it didn't use. It used a 600-pound bomb and a hundred civilians die. These things will happen. But Daniil, that sounds very hard to hear. That what? That we make that mistakes? And kill that many people. I just want to like, give you a chance to explain it's just, that most of the time. No, I'm just saying, but before we get to the most of the time, before we, a, there is you see, when, just, when we get into defense mode all the time, no one takes you seriously. Start by recognizing that in the midst of war, Things, terrible things happen. Mistakes happen. Mm. People shoot without being sure. Now, given within that context, and that's going to happen in any war, the wrong bombs, a building, you, a, a soldier might be more frightened, might identify somebody as a sniper, and it turns out that they're not, and they call in a, uh, a drone or a helicopter or a plane to destroy the building, and there wasn't, and there were people in the building. That's going to happen all the time. If you don't want it to happen, Never go to war and, and, and sort of try to redeem yourself from your humanity. We're flawed. So that the Israeli army makes mistakes, I know. 
I don't think we make more mistakes than other people. I do know, however, that we do m almost everything in our power to avoid civilian casualties when possible. There is no military directive towards ethnic cleansing. Now, Israelis know this because it's our kids in the army. This is not being fought six to 10,000 miles away by someone who you don't know. These are your children. You know the ethics of your children. You also know the ethic and the ethos of the army itself. That same ethos has the Israeli chief of staff after the three terrorists, after the, excuse me, the three hostages were mistaken for Hamas terrorists and they were shot. And the chief of staff gets up in front of the whole country and says, this is not what we do. When civilians um, surrender, we do not fire. Not only civilians, he said, when Hamas surrenders, we do not fire. A combatant in the Israeli army is somebody who has the, the, um, the intent and the means to kill you. They might not love you, they might not like you. If they don't have the means and they don't have the intent, they're a non-combatant and under Israeli military code, you have to do everything in your power to avoid civilian casualties. Does that mean that every officer in the field at every time takes the same level of precaution? Does it mean that sometimes somebody might be frightened, someone might be angry, someone might have just lost a friend, that sometimes they will shoot and That will happen. That's, that's just, it's that are we, are, am I going to claim that we're pure angelic? Not at all. War is crap. War is hell. And it brings out the hell in people. Now, despite that, the Israeli army does everything in its power. Now, I know these are things that, again, aren't reported, but it's not, about, it's not about winning in the public relations story. I know that every single unit in the army has an officer who's in charge of liaisoning with the, with the civilian population. And every single time there's a civilian in, in a certain area, they go, they contact them, they try to get them to move before we move in. They try to identify, is this building truly a military target or is it so? We try. Now it's true, in Gaza, somewhere in the vicinity of 20,000 civilians, 15 to 20,000 civilians have been killed. That's true. I'm not belittling it. Some of them are unjustified. Many of them are simply a result of the fact that in Gaza, you can't fight without killing civilians. It's the nature of Gaza. Gaza is the most complicated war zone that I have ever, not personally encountered, studied and seen a, a, the integration of a military together with a civilian population, the utilization of civilian um, um, buildings and sites for military purposes. It's, it's unbelievable. So it's true. Um, civilians are going to die and have been killed but that there is an ethnic cleansing. The, the greatest weakness of Israel is not in the way it's conducted the war. The greatest weakness of Israel is in our lack of embracing humanitarian aid for Gazans. That's where we lost the credibility of the world. Um, in the fighting itself, that, you know, there, was, there were campaigns, smear campaigns, even the number 32,000 doesn't make any distinction between Hamas and non-Hamas. So all of that was against us. But where we dropped the ball and are continuing to drop the ball um, is on humanitarian aid. And here too, we were very technical because in theory, in a war zone, you're not responsible to feed your enemy. You're just responsible to not prevent food from entering the, the, and, and feeding civilians. But if your enemy is using that food, then you're not even provide to allow, you're not even obligated to provide it. So all of this, so technically, we're fine. Hamas is taking it, taking the food. We have every right not to let, you, to let humanitarian aid in. But still, okay. So inter it, could you? No. The whole world is, um, um, is seeing the pictures. There's, there's two million people here. And that's where we, we lost the world when they stop being convinced that we care about um, humanitarian crisis. And that actually leads us beautifully to the book because you so much talk about whether Jews should just be focused on each other as we figure out kind of what is our, our core identity. Um, but I want to go back to the Jews, the title, who are the Jews? 
Why, first of all, the plural? Because that's who we are. There is no such thing as a Jew. What do you uh, mean by that? We don't exist in isolation. Unlike Buddhism, there is no personal nirvana. There is no individual redemption. Judaism is a religious system for a people in a community. When you talk about Judaism, you have to talk about Jews. Uh, you could be a Jew as long as you're part of the Jews. And the question is, a, is in the plural. There is a people here. How do we understand this people? Also, it's not a question about who you are. Like, who, who am I? Like, I have a Judaism that I love. I don't know who else loves it, but I love my Judaism. I like it. I'm proud of it. It challenges me. I put it together for over close to 60-something years of actually working on it, trying to figure out how do I live my Jewish life. That's wonderful. But that's of no interest unless it somehow connects to a larger collective story. And so the book is a search to try to understand not who is a Jew, like what, what do you have to do? Like, like how many mitzvot do you have to do? Or are you a good Jew, a bad Jew? It's like, leave that question alone. This community, Jews, this collective, because that's the story that we, that we embrace. When God says to Abraham, go forth from your father's house, from your birthplace, to the land that I'll show you, he doesn't say, and I'm going to have a great time with you, and I'll take care of you. He says, I'll make of you a great nation. Immediately it goes to that collective. So this is a search to try to figure out who are we? Because I'm, I'm part of this we. And that we, by the way, is what I love. For me, I, you know, I like Judaism. But the thing that I, I'm part of a people. I'm part of a collective. And so is there a way to talk about who we are that gives room for individual Jews to breathe but still develop some form of a collective um, definition? You write, the story that Jewish people tell ourselves about ourselves is in need of a revision. Yes. We, and then it goes on a little bit later. We Jews need a story we can see ourselves in, one that offers meaning and moral guidance to help us navigate our lives, and one we want to pass on. Right. Do you think we're lacking that? Oh, I know we are. I know we're underachieving. Um, but that's not new. You know, Jews have been underachieving since, or actually humanity underachieves also, so maybe we're, we're, quite, we're, we're quite consistent. But is but, the underachieving partly the infighting? No. The no. sense of like, I'm ju judging how Th Jewish that's you a bi are? That's a bi That's part of, let's call it, that's the crap of the Jewish world. But the underachieving, there's a difference. There's the underachieving and there's the destructive dimension. Um, the underachieving part is, what, what does Judaism mean for you? You're a part of a people. You wake up in the morning, you're committed to this people. You wake up in the morning and you open the news and you want to find out what's happening to the Jews and you care about Israel, and you care about your community, and you care about your synagogue. You also, you worry. So what, for what, what is this group supposed to do in the world? What is it that you see yourself? What is the mission? What is the story that you tell yourself about yourself? And I believe most Jews would have great difficulty answering, what am I supposed to, who am I? What is this people? So tikkun olam is not bad. It's a good one. It's like tikkun olam is almost an expression of the best of the Jewish people. It means that we care about ethics. It means that we don't just care about ourselves, we also care about the world. It means that we've decided that we're going to be a force for good in this world, no matter how small we are and no matter how much you hate us. We're going to, so there's something But the tikkun olam framework gets a lot of heat and grief these days. Yeah, people think it's watered down. It is, but you know, it gets a lot of, it, it, it gets attacked because it doesn't have enough particular identity to it. Like, it doesn't have enough Jewishness to it. No, it has a lot of Jewishness. I mean, it in, have, in, in the critic size. In the, it, yes, I know. So, so, you know, there's, there's all these, you know, the way we, like, who's a good Jew? There's all these different answers that people try to give. And very often, um, the answers are, who's a good Jew? Me. And therefore, if you're not like me, you're a bad Jew. Or then we extend it to say, a good Jew is someone who's going to have Jewish grandchildren. Now, that's one of the most aggressive, abusive statements. Because, Why? Because who your grandchildren are going to be is not dependent on you. You could be a great Jew. And who your grandchildren are going to be. Also, the world has changed. The people who are saying it, my, my parents lived in a world where there was no intermarriage. It just didn't exist. So Jews, of course, you can have Jewish grandchildren, because that's if you have kids, you're going to have Jewish kids. But now, People are marrying, and the Jewish identity is so much more complicated, and, and the world loves us or embraces us, 
and doesn't, you know, marrying a Jew is actually something coherent. Now, beforehand, why would you marry a Jew? It would be insane. Now, people are willing to marry Jews. There's, it's so much more complicated. So, to come and to insult somebody and to say, oh yes, your Judaism is a failure. Now, it's true, tikkun olam is not enough. Because ethics is not enough. When you build a collective, you also have to have particular expressions of your collective life. You can't just be a child of the world and say, what's the identity of my collective, of my particular identity? We serve the world. So then why not be part of that world? Now, there's nothing wrong with tikkun olam. It's actually very beautiful. What's wrong with it is that it's just not enough. And so when you wake up in the morning and you say, yes, I want the Jewish people to continue. Why? Why? What is it that, what, just, what is it that inspires Jews? What is it that you care about? Why is it important to you? How much Judaism do you do? How thick is your Jewishness? So the story we tell is actually not thick enough and, and interesting enough to inspire Jews to do more. And so yes, we're, you know, we've been schlepping along for 3,000 years. Thank God there's been an adequate amount of anti-Semitism to keep Jews more or less in with our collective identity. But at the end of the day now, what do you want? What do you want? When someone says to you, why should I be Jewish? When someone says to you, why should I care about Israel? What's your answer? And if you don't have one, then we, that's an example of us underachieving. Danielle, it takes up a lot of time, the difference between the Genesis and the Exodus framework in this book, but I found them so kind of energizing and, and clear to me, uh, even though as dense as they are. And tell me if I'm right, that the Genesis framework is this sense of unconditional love, that it's not what you do, it's just who you are. Yes. You're, you have God's love and, this, and, and, it's, and it's kind of by God's grace, it's not you haven't earned it. Correct. Exodus, there's actually some requirements, That's some right. expectations. Right. So if I'm right just for the lay audience <laughs> of setting that up so they can now hear a little bit deeper, why, first of all, why have you set up that dichotomy? Um, first of all, I discovered it. Uh, it's no, or other people have talked in, in different terms, but I was, for years I was always bothered by the book of Genesis. It's a really interesting book, but everybody in there is kind of mediocre. After Abraham, then you, you have Rebecca, she's okay, but other than that, they don't do anything. What do you mean Rebecca, like, put her son up to a terrible deception? Uh, that's, that's true. I, so, you know, I... I and Abraham I, really... So that, mean, that means they're, you're right, and Abraham was willing to kill his to kid. To kill his son. But, but other than that, <laughs> other than that, uh, <laughs> other than, they at least, these are people of, you, you feel their depth. Right. You feel their, like, that they're flawed, you know? Welcome, welcome to the human race. But the rest of the book is not about people who are human and flawed. It's, it's just people who are flawed from Jacob and his kids. And you know, as you're reading and sitting, and maybe because I'm ADHD and I'm just reading through and I'm saying, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> like, like, I'm in shul again and I'm sitting and listening to this story and like, okay, like for what? And for years. You're a rabbi <laughs> saying this. Well, it's not, it's the book. <laughs> the book, it's like these are barely adequate people. And then I'm sitting there and okay, and at least I'm not a rabbi of a synagogue. If I was a rabbi of a synagogue and I had to actually lecture and give a, a drasha every week. every week on these people, it's like you're sitting there like, what are, we, what are we doing here? Genesis 1 through 11, really interesting. 12 little parts. Abraham, good. I might not like Genesis 22, but at least it's powerful. And then. You Tell start, everyone what Genesis 22 is for is those who haven't memorized it. <laughs> no, these are the like these are the codes. These are the codes. These are the codes. I'm showing betraying my ignorance. And Genesis not, no. 22 is the binding of Isaac, okay. the Akedah. Genesis 18 is the story of 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 Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Genesis Gomorrah. 12 is the election. So you have these great chapters, and uh, and then you come to Isaac, who basically after his father tried to kill him never got over it and just sort of is like this. So like this strange person, so I'm watching this, and then I come to Jacob, and I come to Jacob's children, and to Joseph, and I'm saying, what's going on here? And so what the rabbinic tradition always did is they rewrote the book of, of Genesis, and they made Jacob into a Talmud scholar, and Joseph, they, they thickened the plot, and basically gave them personalities, and gave them virtues that they didn't have. And I never liked this rabbinic rereading. And at one point it dawned on me, it was after I read um, from the book of Nehemiah, 
think it's chapter 11, where Nehemiah says, God, you're fantastic. You're just unbelievable. Everything you promised, you delivered on. This is pre-Holocaust, pre-destruction, pre-everything. This is in the Bible, God is more or less fantastic. Everything that God says God's going to do, God does, and God has a lot of power. So God, he said, you're great. But us, he says, from the first moment, we have done nothing. We have failed the covenant. And he uses this as a critique. And basically saying that for the first thousand years, the Jewish people didn't, didn't observe Judaism. So I said, what's going on here? And then I, I, I dug further and further, and then it came to me. God says to Abraham, you have to go forth. You have to prove your loyalty. You have to earn it. But your children get the blessing because of you. That means a deep part of being Jewish is not about earning something. That being Jewish and, and, and Jewish life is being accepted and loved for who you are, regardless of what you do. And then I began to explore this idea in, in 2,000 years of Jewish thought. And you see it coming back over and over and over again. One of the great statements of the rabbinic tradition is a Jew, even though they have sinned, they are still a Jew. What it basically means is that there's nothing you can do to lose your Jewishness. And I said, oh, that's a covenant. Where did it start? That's the book of Genesis. Remember, in Genesis, there are no Ten Commandments. There are no commandments at all. Because the, the, the mediocrity of the Jews of Genesis is actually the point. Jews are Jews. One generation, they're going to be greater. One generation, they're going to be worse. But you yourself, it's telling now to you, Abby, to me, Daniel, God says, I'm in a covenant with you. I love you. I expect things, but you don't have to earn it. Jewishness is who you are. And it's almost before there were nation states, there were Jews. But we didn't see this as a political reality. It was part of our religious identity. That it's just like keeping Shabbos. Jews keep Shabbos, and that's part of their Judaism. Jews are connected to each other, and that's part of their Judaism. Not part of our collective identity. It's not anti-Semitism. It's not we are a people and a religion. No. Our religion is that you are part of a people, and that you are loved, and that you are embraced, and that you are accepted, and no one could ever kick you out, and there is no such thing as a good Jew or a bad Jew. You're just a Jew. Now, that, just sit with that. Let that touch you. Let, let, let it roll over your consciousness. And if you look at the way Jews understood themselves, it is so deep. We're just Jews. Now, the doing Jewish comes later, but it's secondary. And before we get to the doing Jewish, does that apply to the convert, that, oh, that, that sense of having something to It's a great bestowed? question. It's actually a really complicated answer. Because in the Bible, there are no converts. Genesis itself didn't lead to conversion. There was no possibility of conversion, and there were no converts in the Bible. Genesis, though, allowed for intermarriage. Because you can join not by converting, you can join by joining the family. So just like someone we So Moses' wife is what? That's exactly. She's, she never converted. Bible. The only pseudo- but Is she a Jew? <laughs> she's, she's married to a Jew. And therefore her children, she becomes part of the Jewish people. So in the, in the biblical story, Conversion is, is in, the, in the Genesis story, you can't become, you could marry in. Mm. Um, it is the rabbis who then um, introduce the idea of conversion, and then they are very, very careful and very explicit to state that you could convert into being a Genesis Jew. So Judaism was never a race because you could marry those outside of the Jewish people. So we were never this ethnic, pure group. But with the rabbis, part of when a person converts, actually the core of rabbinic conversion is that we ask someone, why do you want to be Jewish? Don't you know that the Jewish people are persecuted and have a difficult life? And when the person says, I know and I am unworthy, they are accepted immediately. The condition to becoming a Jew is, are you willing to be a Genesis Jew? Are you willing to see yourself that as, as part of a people who walk with God? That's it. And God embraces you, accepts you, and then there becomes no distinction between the convert and the, and the person who was born Jewish. You also say that it goes to this idea of kind of collective responsibility for each yes. other. If a fellow Jew is in trouble, we do not ask which commandments they observed and which they transgressed. 
we just stand up and say, here I am, what can I do? That's Genesis. Which to me is also the post-October 7th. That's correct. It's moment. a very deep part of who we are. You're part of a people, our story is that we've walked together for three, 4,000 years. That's our story. Whether it's true or not doesn't matter. That's the story we tell. Whether we really were in Egypt or not doesn't matter. Our story is that we were in Egypt together. And to be a Jew is to embrace that story. And so if God accepts you, your job is also to accept Jews. If God has a loyalty to you, you're supposed to be loyal to Jews. If God extends grace to Jews, you have to extend grace to Jews. And so all of that, those are the commandments of Genesis. It's not ritual and it's not ethics. It's a it's not rules. It's not rules. It's there. There's obligations, but it's you have to want to be part of the Jewish people and you have to embrace the responsibilities of being part of a people. And that starts with saying, I am responsible for you. And so when Moses and the Jewish people are about to go into the land of Israel and um, the, the tribe of Reuven and Gad um, actually come out, are coming from Jordan and there's, you know, God says that Israel is the land of, uh, of milk and honey, but like that's kind of a huge it's joke, you know, it's like, it was actually, it's not the greatest, you know, we made it to a pretty nice place, but these people, they're, they're coming from the other side of the Jordan and they are um, shepherds. And they say, whoa, there's, there's great land here for shepherds. There's great grazing ground. And they say, Most, can we just sort of get out of this deal? Like, you get the land of milk and honey, I'll get the other one, but could I sort of stay here? And Moses stands up and says in Hebrew, he says in the Bible, Are your brothers and sisters going to go to war? And are you going to stand here? That's the argument. There's, we're family. Whether it's, we're not a racial family, we're a mythic family, we're an imagined family. We see each other as family, I'm bound to you, I'm responsible for you, I have to accept you. All of these are the calls of Genesis. And so this tolerance, it's not, it's not loose with Judaism, it's not, it has nothing to do with that. It's about taking peoplehood as a religious concept seriously. I am obligated. I am obligated to live with Jews. I, when, I remember when I was a rabbi in North America, I decided there was never going to be a Jew's home who I didn't eat in. It was never, no such thing. If a Jew invited Despite me to eat, being kosher, kosher. doesn't matter, no such thing. No such thing. I was, gonna, I was gonna eat. And if it meant that I had to not worry about a pot and a dish, I wouldn't worry about a pot and a dish. And you know what happened? When I made that leap of grace, People responded, and when I'd come to their home, they, it was like El Al, you know, it was like the food was triple wrapped, and it took me, you know, they one, moved heaven and one, earth. one of the advantages of wearing a kippah is that it has bobby pins. You know why bobby pins are necessary? Not only to keep your, your kippah on your head, it's because it enables you to pierce all this plastic and tin foil, and you try opening up a kosher meal on an airplane without a kippah, you're dead in the water. So I'm coming, every, I just, I, I but when you made the decision to eat in any Jew's any home, home, no such thing. Your, that was your Genesis Judaism. That's my. I'm obligated. I didn't make a choice. But not I to was shame religion. them, not to make it impossible to sit at their table. Eating with them is a religious obligation. So I won't eat non-kosher, but I don't have to. I can eat in your home, and I don't have to. And, and then people would ask me. And at the end, it, I was never fed non-kosher food, but that's an example. When your family... Which family, you know, like now I have all these food sensitivities. I'm like... You're like, impossible. I'm I, can impossible. I can attest. <laughs> you don't want to cook for me. It's like, it's just not worth it. But like, wherever I go, we're so sensitive to... Because what does it mean? When someone, comes to my, when someone comes to your home now, what's the first question you ask them besides how many people are coming? Do you, do you have any food sense? We want to... Because right. I want to host you. Because mm -hmm. inviting you to my home is not about giving you food. It's about embracing you as a human being and seeing you. And so I want to make sure... I see Jews, and Genesis says, that's your obligation. See them, love them, respect them. Don't judge them all the time. Don't put them down. Okay, and, but Daniel, there's a lot of judgment of each other. Yeah, there were bad Genesis Jews. So let's switch to <laughs> Exodus, just so yeah, we that's have time where, for it. That's this where the good where, stuff comes and the bad stuff, just like Genesis. This is where it gets to be a little bit of a, of a tougher Yeah, it's true. Measurement. It gets tougher. Now, the truth is, I'm an Orthodox Jew, but my favorite part of Judaism is Genesis Judaism. 
I love it. It inspires me. It's very deep in my soul. It's like this is, I'm part of a people. Well, how but are you same, in Exodus, Jew? But at the same time, I realize, just like you said, oh, you were talking about beforehand, are we underachieving? At the end of the day, Jewish survival is not an end unto itself. What are we here for? Okay, we are a people loved by God and embraced by God and said by God, said by God no matter who you are, no matter where you go, I'm still going to stay with you. I'm going to stay with you and I'm going to love you and I want you to feel that love. But at the end of the day, Exodus comes along and says, you know, that was nice, but is that it? <laughs> is that it? And in Exodus 19, God speaks to Moses and says, speak unto the children of Israel and say, that you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God says, I actually want more from you. I want you to be Abraham's. Just like Abraham had to prove and, to, and live the difficult life, but had to stand up and do something, I want you to do something. And Exodus 20 is the first of the 20, of the, is where the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. That's a Genesis act. And Exodus says, and now you shall have no other gods besides me. And what unfolds is a list and a litany of hundreds of commandments. But they're basically God saying to the Jewish people, be more. I want something of you. And so it's true. Exodus could be seen as, an, as a fixed list that everybody has to embrace. And if you don't keep the important ones, like do you keep Shabbos? Do you keep kosher? Do you do A, B, C, D? How many brachas did you say? When's the last time you prayed? Where do you pray? All of the above. And we could then create a system. But the principle of, just, of Exodus is what I point to. The collective story idea of Exodus is that to be Jewish is to do something. To be Jewish is to aspire to be more. That if Genesis is who you are, Exodus is who are you going to become. And this is your obligation. Now, where Genesis doesn't have good Jews and bad Jews, Exodus has good Jews and bad Jews. Where Genesis demands you to embrace Jews for who they are, Exodus demands of you to expect Jews, of Jews, more than who they are. And it's are. conditional. And it you is conditional. You can lose God's love. You can lose God's love, absolutely. But ultimately what happens is that, this is the argument of the book, is that the two live with each other and they have to balance each other. And I show how for most of Jewish history they balanced each other and when they don't, that's when we, that's when we get lost. And so Exodus, Exodus is fantastic as long as it's mitigated by some Genesis consciousness. Genesis consciousness is great as long as you have Exodus expectations. So it's about, like everything in life, it's about a balance between the two. So the story that the Jews have told ourselves about ourselves for three, four thousand years is that we are Genesis and Exodus Jews. We are embraced for who we are and challenged to become more because of who we are. And to always balance these two things together. And when they do, then we are a people who push. When they're out of balance, we're either a people who are middashteshing, staying in place, or we stop being a people. And then we become a little shul or a little denomination and a bunch of self-righteous people who wake up in the morning and ask, oh, who could I, who could I insult today? Who could I make feel, feel inferior today? Who, who's just not living up to my standard? Who do I have the power to, to somehow put in second place? All that crap, that's, that's the Yetzirah, that's the evil inclination of Exodus. The evil inclination of Genesis is to be mediocre. And so each one, um, when they live together, um, co hopefully compensate. You call us all Jews by choice. Yes. And you say, as Jews by choice, the central choice, even before deciding whether to belong at all, is deciding which of our stories we claim for ourselves right. and tell our children. Right. Which stories are we choosing from? Well, again, Jews around the world are choosing from lots of different places. Some of the stories we choose are stories from our surroundings. Many Jews aren't even telling Jewish stories. Many Jews are telling American, Canadian, British, Australian. Um, many people are telling economic stories. They're telling political party stories. We're telling gender stories. We're telling, we choose lots and lots of stories. And the question is, do we have a Jewish story that we also tell? Um, so by nature, people tell stories. Um, but do we have a compelling Jewish story? And uh, we're Jews by choice, 
because we have to choose what story we tell. Now here too goes back to the, you started with Israel. You know, what is the story of Israel that we're going to tell? Are we going to tell the story of the victimhood and the tragedies of October 7? Are we going to tell stories about the Israeli army trying to uh, minimize civilian casualties, even though it does so imperfectly? Are we going to tell stories about the military ethic, which demands that all non-combatants be protected? Are we going to tell stories about um, those in Israel who stand up and quote from the Bible and say only Jewish lives matter? So there's what story we're going to tell. Ben Gvir, Smotrich tells stories. Netanyahu tells a story. Gantz tells a story. Actually, a lot of people aren't even telling stories right now. We're in trauma. And part of the challenge of Israel is how do we reclaim a story? Because for so long, it's part of the reason why we don't have a strategy. We let the other ones tell their story. They have a story that we are colonialists, that we're apartheid, that now we're genocide. And what do we do? We defend. So there is a story. But what's your story? Your story, it defending yourself is a tactic. It's not a strategy. But you even mentioned earlier, almost as an aside, this, that anti-Semitism has been the glue in many ways. A glue. A glue yeah. for Jewish identity. It's been very powerful in North America. Yeah. If you go to a lot of Jewish fundraisers, it's often the narrative of how many people hate us. Yeah. And I'm not decrying that. I'm, I'm just acknowledging yeah, it's it. It's just not that inspiring. It's just kind of a pathetic story. But October, post-October 7th, it's, true. it's different. It's true. It just Because it's more real doesn't make it less pathetic. You understand? It's real. It's true, we do have enemies. We tend to over-exaggerate it because it compensates for the lack of content in our story. So here it is, it's now there's vibrancy, I'm fighting against an enemy, it's like, here it is. You know, when there's evil, fighting it is, a me is meaningful. And so sometimes we, get, we fall in love with it too much, but at the end of the day, that's why you're Jewish? Really? That's what you're here for? Just to make sure that Jews could overcome anti-Semitism? It's, it's necessary. There's a difference between doing that which is necessary and doing that which is meaningful and inspiring. Now, you don't want to do things that are meaningful and inspiring and overlook the necessary because you're going to be dead. So part of what happens is post-October 7th, we've learned not to poo-poo anti-Semitism anymore. Great. We're not going to poo-poo it. It's there. It's real. Even though it's not yet existential anti-Semitism. You know, my test for anti-Semitism, when people say America's coming to an end, we have to, I look for who's selling their real estate businesses. You know, forget, I'm not asking whether you're buying a house in the German colony. You know, if you have excess money and you're already on to your fourth house, why not have a fifth? But who's selling their real estate? Nobody. Nobody. That means that with all of it, it's not, America's still home. Now, when America is home, you need a more compelling story about what you're supposed to do when you wake up in the morning. And when you tell the college, a college student and you say, I want you to go and fight for Israel, I want you to fight against the anti-Semites, you first have to tell them why Israel matters, why Judaism matters. Judaism and Israel don't matter because people are attacking it. It matters because it inspires and it creates a life of meaning. Now, if you don't defend it, you won't have an Israel, granted. But the, the anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist story is an evil that we have to confront. But it's not something that gives to Jewish life any content and any vitality. It just doesn't. It gives you a short, it's like a drug sometimes. You inject it, it's a high. You feel, oh, we're going to get together. We have a rally. It's important. We're raising money. We're, oh. Uh. And then, what happens with all drugs? So I hear. <laughs> Like, what do I know? You don't even drink wine. <laughs> I don't even drink wine. I did hold a bottle of, uh, of cannabis, I must get, of medical you marijuana. Held I held my mother's without the TCP, I think it is, or well, it has one thing in it without. You crossed the Rubicon. I crossed it, I held the bottle, and my hands were shaking. So I don't, but there is a hangover. And then you let down, and then you look, and your kids are going to wake up, and they realize that they could go to campus, and if they hide their Jewish star, or even if they have a Jewish star, they just don't go to an Israel rally. And they don't want to talk about Israel. And they just want to lower their head. And they just want to have an American experience. They want to go to college. They want to leave their house, just like Abraham. They want to leave their home. And they want to leave their family. But they don't want to walk, go to the land that God is giving them. They want to go to America, where they're going to meet different people, where hopefully 
at least in theory, they're going to have an open-minded conversation. But they're, they're not going to be accused of genocide. Where they're, or they're, they're not going to be, they're just, they don't even want to talk about it. They just want to go where, where there's an open-minded conversation about anything without crazy limits and, and lack of open-mindedness and prejudgment. They just want to go and have for four years this, this intellectual, moral, spiritual, and personal journey of openness. And frankly, no one could blame them. So they're not going to give that up in order to fight for Israel. They might give it up if they care about Israel. But that means that Israel has to earn their trust, earn their respect. Again, they have to be able to tell a story, not a story of how I defend Israel and how it's false that we are not committing, that we're, it's false to claim that we're committing, that we're committing genocide. That's easy. What's harder is to say why it's important. And when it's important, then you, you, you know... And why it's important to you. Why it's important to me. Why do I care? But I mean, why do to I... you, you 22-year-old. That's correct. And it could very well be, by the way, that some of the answers aren't really great for 22-year-olds. It could very well be that, that, that the college experience might not be the place where we have to give the strongest content. We have to defend them. We have to make it safe. But it's a, it's, it starts from your childhood. It starts from the bar mitzvahs. What does it mean when you're a bar mitzvah? It doesn't mean that you know a little Hebrew and you can read something that you didn't. You, it's not a ceremony. There's a journey in, in, in from, again, when you're conscious, from, from your teens, in your high schools, in your camps, in your schools, and again, through your 20s. Part of it is that you're part of a story. You're part of a story, but then you have to say, why is this important? And then you have to ask, what do I do about it? How does it claim me? You can't claim that something's important if it doesn't claim you. Like if somebody said, oh, to your, if you said to your husband or I said to my wife, I love you. You're the most important thing in my life. I can't imagine my life without you. Even sprinkle in a little Jerry Maguire, you complete me. Great, you say the whole thing and then you say, and I look forward to seeing you twice a year. Really? That's like, now we're talking, it's about doing and engaging and thinking. And so that's, that's, that's the journey. I actually want to end with your faith. Maybe it's, it's not fair, but I heard you on, uh, on the podcast that I love with Yossi, basically saying that your faith gives you little comfort. Right. And I want to understand that because you seemed, you seem so faithful to me. I, um, and I don't mean faithful, 300, 613 commandments right. faithful. I am faithful in the sense that I'm optimistic. Um, I see reality for what it is, but I never feel defined by reality. I never feel that reality um, puts me in a box and determines where I'm going to be. I, 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 I have a tremendous amount of faith in the possibility of, of changing and of good things happening in the world. Just God doesn't help me. That's what I mean. God is not... God is there. God is the creator of the world. God is a being who reminds me that I'm not God. God, God for me is the great humilifier. He has to remind human beings that, who, that you're, you're dust and ashes, whatever you want to do. But God, in my world, gave to human beings in Genesis 1 all the skills and the mandate to rule the world and master it. And, and then it's up to us. So. Unfortunately, I don't, I, I don't have anybody I could count on. I don't have anybody I could say, oh, it's getting really, really hard. God, could you help me now? I don't have that. And God's not rescuing. God's the, listen, Jewish history has more or less proven that, you know, so it's, uh, but I have faith in Jewish people. I have faith in Genesis Jews. Um, I have faith in Jews who at the end embody Exodus principles, who at the end are going to want to do more, are going to want to be more, are going to want to be worthy of being a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, are going to stand together. And when we do, we could overcome. So is there faith? Yes, it's just not a theological, um, miraculous faith that somehow everything will always work out for the better because God has our back. Things will work out for the better if we stand up and take responsibility for each other and take responsibility to build a great people and a great country, 
which will be a light. And uh, so that I have faith in that, that it will be, but it's in our hands to do so. Rabbi Dr. Daniel Hartman, thank you thank for you. this time. Thank you for this book. It is called, Who Are the Jews and Who Can We Become? And it's not that long, which today actually is a very, I did a that selling point. Remember, I'm ADHD. I wrote a book that I would want to read. You, and, and that people can finish. Um, it's been good to be with you. I'm Abigail Pogrebin for In the Spotlight, and I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.